the first in the world, which is when half the people in the room come from very far away, they get closer, they can die from here with us to discuss pain, pain, and uncertainty, definition, transmission, reception. And uh, I'd like to thank a number of persons. First, my co organizers, Michel Fuchs from the University of Milan, who is an expert in Pompeian and uh, Vesuvian painting and the classical archaeology in general, and really share that with our persons who are helping us in this magic place, the Swiss Museum of Games. We have the support of the Swiss Academy of Humanities and Social Sciences. And we organize this conference also in collaboration with us, so the Association for Women of Clergy in Switzerland. We welcome two members of the Association. And of course, the University of Lausanne, thanks to Michel Fuchs. And we have the great privilege to have received the label of the European Year of Cultural Heritage. And we will see that indeed, within these three days, the past will be. Future, thanks among others to Katina Marcia, who has a beautiful project on how we can try to the reception of uh, antiquity in today's youth literature and so on. But of course, this is all under the roof of the ERC Locus Ludi, part of fabric of play and games in classical antiquity. And the view that you have of the Swiss Museum of Games is to recall the familiar you are. But that it all started in a sense here, with an exhibition that took place during the whole year in 2014 15, and with three sites to explore uh, Ludic culture. So in Lyon, in La Tour de Paix, the site of the reception of antiquity, and in Valle de Dallas Pass, investigating uh, the rules. And one part of this project, and sometimes the whole part of that, that exhibition, is still trying. If we open the room, we move in our 2019. It's a long time. It's a long time. <laughs> 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 so, uh, the PRC is something very, very important because it is the first time that you use the topic of game to the dress of And I have a very brief view of what, what we had before. We have already reflections on the cultural dimension of games by anthropologists, psychologists, social historians, and we will see the famous book by Johan Zinga or Roger Gallois or Brian Sapin Smith. Very important people. But none explore antiquity, classical antiquity, extensively. In fact, research on ancient ludic material culture started quite recently, a very the first search. In the 1919, with Pierre Feeder having the British Museum uh, conference, and there was a splendid exhibition on Marseille 1991. We have here, who was one of the active part of, 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 this, uh, of this project in, in Marseille. Do we know you, and it is just a glimpse to Mark Bergen from the New Year of the Indian Bergens. 1919 is when Mark first appeared in childhood, so it was time with the point.
to get the housing fortune and has now been translated into English, which is free access. It allows the free, while we play in anthropological study. And we have another partner, an anthropologist, Thierry Bendy, who explained why in anthropology in France, so little has been done. Anthropology of ancient history, the relation to the place, or education, emotion, but also performance a body of the movement. And at the end of the day, we finish with origins, religious tradition, and we will hear uh, Katina Massina, uh, who will address this question of the uh, uh, Aya Lakta as a long story of uh, that expression. Tomorrow, uh, we are going to talk about the general definition. I am very happy that my partner, Tina Tina Pelma, are here to represent the service association for women after the gene specimen. We are in the field, and we know what they talk about, what they have found, and when we see objects in context, because this is something absolutely necessary to do. What does one find in a regional camp, in the town? And uh, what is the unique equipment, and that's why we are here, yeah? because uh, you know what, what you show. So, how do you define it as well? Talk about Alexandrian counters, SRI, metal bones, how they play, diminishing the weights. And we will come to the following, who has also in our sea of total communities in the ancient Mediterranean. In the afternoon, we pass to iconographic definition, and when you see this, that is easy to identify place where. That's play start, we have a right start, and we can use some play in Proverbs, we have a public super, and we have a death, of course, and we have the privilege to meet the descendants of David Foucault, who is also called Louis and David Foucault, who we introduced his ancestor, and then we pass that, and then we can see the immense research that Michel Monson has done on this big man, really a very important person. And so we will finish with Polis. Because Polis is one of the sources that we have, and there is a lot to debate about transmission, also about how we want to appropriate the past, about reception of these games in modern um, culture, and we will see uh, movies with modern Greek uh, games. So, to finish, um, uh, I remind you that we have a website where you can meet us, we have a blog and newsletter. We are constructing also a network of experts, and I think all I have to say now is up to us to play. Uh, so, mm -hmm. what is to do? Thank you. So, we ask the world to go back to the universe, and then to Mark Golden, and then we can make it to introduce Mark into the well, just a warm welcome to you all on behalf of the uh, team of the Swiss Museum of Games. Um, the Swiss Museum of Games in Africa is still, as far as I know, the only museum of the kind. Um, uh, well, I know the museum entirely dedicated to history of games, not of toys. Uh, but games from uh, all times and from all over the world. So um, we will have a, a guided tour, a visit of the uh, museum tomorrow, but of course in the events you are free to uh, um, have a look or maybe uh, whenever you like. Uh, we also have a beautiful museum shop with uh, a lot of interesting classical and also recent games, so uh, don't hesitate if you like to uh, buy some gifts for you or for your know, friends and family to uh, pass by the final shop. Also, just um, uh, one announcement, tomorrow at uh, 6 o'clock we will inaugurate officially uh, the painting uh, that uh, the French artist Poseidon has um, realized in the gardens around the, uh, the castle. This is a, a painting of the kind of uh, anamorphosis. So uh, we, we, we painted it on the grass um, uh, on top of the, uh, the, the castle. And you can see the picture just by 
going up the, uh, the stairs uh, to the tower, on the tower. You can see from the back. You do not uh, see what you can decide because it's 2,000 square meters that fit this. Uh, so tomorrow at um, 6 o'clock, there will be uh, the official uh, opening ceremony uh, of this uh, painting that has been done in uh, the context of the festival in which uh, actually takes place at the moment uh, in Verde and Plateau with about 60 exhibitions, uh, all based on basically on photography. Uh, so um, if you have the time, you, you uh, should also be walking in Verde and uh, have a look at these um, artworks that are exposed until the end of the month. So, um, but tomorrow we will have uh, the guide tour in the afternoon and the, the opening. We are welcome of course, to participate in this uh, ceremony and then we share more sources um, uh, public conference uh, in the evening. So, uh, this is um, on what I want to say for the moment and uh, well, I think I'm looking forward to our discussions. And Thank you very much for coming. Mm. <laughs> Alors, en récente conquise de, de, de notre précédent colloque sur le hasard et le jeu, Véronique me rend le privilège d'introduire et d'être le chair de cette super matinée avec euh, plusieurs exposés qui vont vous ramener sur les thèmes qu'on a déjà beaucoup discuté. Mais je donne tout de suite la, la parole à Marc Gordon, euh, qui peut venir s'installer. Et qui, euh, vous connaissez, vous avez eu des tout à l'heure en décennie. Il est très connu. Mais c'est ce qu'il est. Je vais continuer en français, parce que nous sommes dans une très petite ville et il n'y a pas de description sur la langue. Donc, je vais continuer à dire. Then for the institute is taking the rest, but I will continue to uh, introduce in French. Um, so Mark has a first book. You have seen the picture of the book, Children and Play, Les Jeux et l'Enfant en 1990, and then on the sport. What we are interested in is the articulation between the sport and the game. That's why the sport is on the sport and on the game. Est-ce que le jeu est compétitif comme le sport C'est une question de propositement fondamentale déjà depuis euh, Omer. Donc, merci beaucoup, Marc. C'est en plus de passer une discussion. Does the people have copies of this uh, very old-fashioned handout that I have brought? Yeah. You let me know. You need to take two pages. You let me know if you can't hear me, okay? Is this all right? Yes. I'm going to talk about the categories, the categories of play and sport in ancient Greece. Categories are always very messy. They are imprecise. They involve overlaps. For example, we are now in Switzerland. I come from Canada. Switzerland has many mountains, and the Swiss are very famous for ski racing, yes? And in Canada, we are very famous for hockey. However, in the most recent World Hockey Championships, in the semi-final, Switzerland defeated Canada 3-2. to <laughs> It seemed so different, but they came together. How could this be? It is because the Swiss put one of their mountains in the goal, and therefore we could not score. So categories which seem so far apart, they sometimes not so far apart after all. So I'm going to talk about the categories of play and sport. Uh, I'm going to start by showing how very different they are. And then 
I'm going to introduce some intermediary categories so things will become more nuance. I will talk about ball games and I will talk about dance and I will raise two questions to begin with, which are the questions A and B on your handout and then perhaps I will ask a broader question about all these activities together. So I will begin with Homer. In Iliad Book 23, the ghost of Patroclus appears to Achilles in a dream. And the ghost reminds Achilles of their long relationship. This is the first text on your handout. Achilles and Patroclus were friends ever since, I'm quoting now, Anoitius brought me, Patroclus, still a small boy from Opus, to your house, Achilles, because of painful manslaughter. On the day when I killed Amphidamus' son in my folly, though I did not intend to, in anger over the knucklebones. Now this story, which the ghost tells, is very clear. While he was still a boy, Patroclus became angry with a playmate because of a game, a game of knucklebones. They were just playing. Because of his anger, Patroclus killed the boy unintentionally, and as a result, he was forced to go into exile, young though he was, and his father brought him to Peleus, Achilles' father, in Thessaly. Now this is not unique. In the Iliad, and also in the Odyssey, others also are said to have been forced to flee into exile as a result of killing someone else. But none of the others is said to have been a child at the time. And in fact, Homer stresses, Homer emphasizes how young Patroclus was. If you look at the text, in line 85, Patroclus is Teuton, a word which is normally used for those who are very young. And then in 88, Patroclus is Napios, Literally, this means an infant, but it's word which is used more generally, also of adults, but of adults who are childish and who are irresponsible and who are unthinking. And in addition, of course, the killing is unintentional. It's the kind of thing a child would do without meaning to. Patroclus' victim is not named. He is merely called the son of Amphidamus. Even an adult can be described in this way in Homer, but here the phrase is fitting because the playmate is very young and has done nothing on his own to earn a name. And finally, this exile, Patroclus, is so young that his father must go along with him when he goes to Achilles' home. Now, for a long time, scholars have asked themselves, what is this? Why do we hear about this? Who cares? What is this story about? And there are many suggestions, but for me, what is important is to look at the context of this brief passage in the poem itself. Patroclus' ghost has a message for Achilles. Do not forget about me, your old friend. See that I have a proper burial. And Achilles listens. That's a goal. You listen to it. So Achilles listens. Achilles, in, to honor Patroclus, organizes contests of sport. In Patroclus' honor, the so called Funeral games of Patroclus. We call them in English funeral games of Patroclus. They are not games. They are sporting activities in honor of Patroclus. And those who take part are adult warriors, 
the comrades of the Falklands and Achilles, they compete in a number of sporting events, many of which are later the main events, the staples of Greek festival competition. There's a chariot race, and then there's a series of tests of strength and skill, a foot race, the throwing of a spear and of heavy weight, boxing, wrestling, archery, even a fight in armor. No one is hurt. No one is killed, certainly. When Ajax is in danger, when he is fighting with weapons with Diomedes, the Greeks immediately call the fight off, so there are no injuries, and both men who are in that fight are given prizes. And in fact, throughout these competitions, Achilles makes sure that every competitor gets a reward. So I see here a contrast. On the one hand, we have play, which is etymologically connected with the very common Greek word for child, the word pice. And on the other hand, we have sport, which is the province, if not absolutely the preserve, of mature men. We play, children engage for its own sake, for the sake of victory. In sport, we have adult men who are competing for prizes. And of course, Patroclus, the boy of play, not only doesn't get a prize, he gets a penalty. He's forced to leave and go into exile. Now, I could develop this longer. I'm not going to do that now. There are other reasons to believe that this contrast is important for Homer. There's one very small point. Those of you who know Greek art are very familiar with the picture of Achilles and Ajax, grown up warriors with their weapons, playing with dice, playing with Ascanio. This is one of the most famous images of all Greek art. There are about 200 versions of this still known that Homer, Homer makes no reference to this story. He, in fact, Homer never talks about Astagaboi, about nothing bones as playthings, except in that story about Patroclus as a boy. For Homer, play is for boys, and men have more important things to do, and sport is one of those important things. Okay, so far? Now, I'm trying here to draw a distinction between play and sport, and to make the difference between them seem as large as possible. Now, I will introduce considerations to bridge this gap and to bring them together, and I will begin with ball games. Ball games are included in the source books that we use when we teach Greek sports. There is a long and important discussion of ball games in English in Harris's book, Sport in Greece and Rome, but it appears in a special section, a section on ball games and fringe activities, along with swimming and rowing and bowling and weightlifting. And similarly, ball games are mentioned in the recent important book by Stephen Miller, which many of us use as a textbook for Greek sport. But there, it's in a chapter called Sport and Recreation. Ball games are not true sport for the ancient Greeks. They are not part of the program in any major athletic festival. They seem to belong more to play than to sport. Now, I suspect that this seems strange to us because so many of our sports involve a ball, whether it's an individual sport, like tennis, whether it's a team sport, how many different kinds of football are there? 
I can count five, and I'm a Canadian. I don't even play football. <laughs> and there's basketball and softball. But for the Greeks, ball games are linked with play and with childhood. A ball is mentioned by Aristotle as the first present for a child. We know of dedications of balls by girls before their marriage, when they're still children, to Artemis by boys when they're just leaving childhood, to Hermes, and in one poem, a ball is said specifically to be a plaything of boyhood, Kuosune's idea. And balls are also occasionally included in the depictions of children, the images of children, on vase paintings like the Koei's and a grave monuments. <clears throat> we can look at Epic again for the connection between ball games, children, and play. The second text that I have reproduced for you with the assistance of Mary and her much more artistic crew, is such a mess my favorite to it. It is from Apollonius of Rhodes in the Hellenistic epic uh, Argonautica. Here, Aphrodite wants Medea to fall in love with Jason, and she bribes her horrible young son, Eros, with a golden ball. A golden ball which was made for Zeus by his nurse when Zeus was still a little baby in the cave on Mount Ida. So here we have a contrast. We have a child's plaything, the golden ball, which is used to produce consequences in the real world for adults, the marriage of Jason and Medea, and terrible consequences too, because if you remember the story, Jason and Medea will have children, and Medea will slaughter those children. So the contrast, the world of play, children, and then it terrible consequences. For another place where ball play is linked with children and games, we can go back to Homer again. This time, not the Iliad, this time the Odyssey. In book six, Odysseus is on Scheria, the island of the Phaeacians. He went, and at this point in book six, the young girl Nausicaa is with other young girls, and they're playing ball. They throw the ball, whoops, where's the ball? And when they go to get the ball, who do they find? They find Odysseus. And Odysseus is a big, hairy, naked man. Here's a little bit of a contrast, I think. A reminder that these are young girls, and this is what awaits them, a very different world in their future. Later in the Odyssey, in book 8, Odysseus is being entertained by Nausicaa's father, the king. He's being entertained through a competition in sport. And in that competition in sport, Odysseus shows his superiority. He throws the discus better than anyone. Despite his age, I feel like, I feel like a, this is back in the 60s again. <laughs> From the psychedelic effects. <laughs> so, uh, it's so much more boring back in the Odyssey. <laughs> Odysseus is being entertained by Nausicaa's father, the king. There's a sporting competition. Odysseus shows that in sport he is the best, despite his age, despite the difficulties of his voyage. Do so I want to point out Odysseus is much younger than I am? and is not Chetla. <laughs> and what do the Phaeacian youths show? They display their excellence in dancing and ball play. They throw the ball back and forth. They try to keep it off the ground. It's not a competition. It's cooperative. They're working together. 
And here as often, we are reminded that the Phaeacians do not live in the real world. They're just on the way for a distance as he goes to his poor little island where real life takes place all the time. But there are links between ball play and competition also, even in the Odyssey. When Nausicaa and her girlfriends are playing, what are they playing? What are they playing? Why does the ball get away? Is it because one of them has what we say in English, butterfingers, and they can't hold the ball? Well, maybe. They start off, they are playing a game of catch, but then they move on to what we call in English, dodgeball. You know how to play this game? Dodgeball. I take a ball, and I throw it at each other, somebody else, and if I hit him, he goes out. He loses. It's a very competitive, very aggressive game, and that is one of the games these girls are playing in Odyssey, Book 8. It's referred to in the Iliad as a, a strange image in the Iliad. Ajax decapitates a Trojan warrior. Do not try this at home, please. Ajax, <laughs> Ajax decapitates a Trojan warrior and takes his head and hurls it through the army like a ball, spire dome, like, like playing dodgeball. So the ball games are not always so cooperative. They are not always so innocent. And there are other links between ball play and combat elsewhere in ancient Greek texts. In Plato, in Plutarch, in Galen. Galen talks about the benefits of playing with a small ball for military training and details how good this is. And at Sparta, we also hear of very important cultural competitions which involve balls. There are a group at Sparta called the Sly Race, the ball players. In later sources, it seems that these are young men who are ready to go into the army. But there is reason to believe that earlier in archaic and classical Sparta, the Cyrus were all of the Spartan men. And this Cyrus compete in team ball games, which we don't know the details. But the winners get prominent inscriptions, the winners get memorials, they are honored, just like athletic victors are elsewhere. So this leads to my first question, question A, why isn't ball play, why are ball sports not part of competitive festivals elsewhere in the Greek world at the major competitions like the Olympics and so on? Okay, in a, this Odyssey Book 8, the Phaeacian moves, moves from ball play to dance, I'm going to do the same thing, not very agile, I promise, because this involves another intermediate category, another category between play and games on the one hand and sport on the other. And I, I'm going to talk about dance both with some nervousness, but also with some confidence, because there are some famous experts on Greek dance with us at this conference. And I, may, I say silly things, you ask them and they will tell you the truth. <laughs> so, what are the links between dance and play? Well, the very word, piety, to play, often means dance in ancient Greek, even as early as the Odyssey. In addition, like play, dance musical instruments, musical instruments used to accompany the dance are among the things that young girls dedicate to Artemis when they leave childhood and become married. So dance is linked to a children play, and dance is also contrasted very strongly with sport. And here we come to the third text that I provided for you, a very famous passage in Herodotus. Chrysanes, the tyrant of Sicyon, 
He wins the four horse chariot race at the Olympic Games. And there, using a herald, the herald that one finds at Olympia, he makes a proclamation. There will be a competition for those who wish to marry his daughter, Agoristi. Come to my place, we will see which is the best of the young Greeks, the best of the young Greeks, you can marry my daughter. He builds a stadium, he builds a hippodrome for horse races, and he invites these suitors who want to marry his daughter to stay with him, just as they would stay in Olympia during the training period. And they compete there in the stadium, in running and wrestling. And among the young men, the favorite is Hippoclides of Athens. But on the last night of the competition for the hand of Agoristi, Hippoclides gets drunk. Go to that little mind. <laughs> and he demonstrates a series of dances. These dances are beneath the dignity of a member of the Greek elite, and they are especially unworthy of the man who is going to marry Cleisthenes' daughter. Finally, at the end of his demonstration of dance, Hippocrates literally stands the norms of Greek life on their head, because he gets on the table, he does a handstand, and he starts waving his feet in the air. And Cleisthenes has had enough. He says, O oh, son of Pisander, again addressing him as a child, men ton gamon. This is usually translated as you dance the way you are married. But it seems clear that there was a pun here on the Greek word orchis, which means the testicles. This is why I put this in front of you. Um, which is a, it's a word that Herodotus knows and uses. So how then to get the meaning of what has happened here? Well, I think it means in respect to your marriage, which is an accusation of respect to the Greek, you have danced your balls off. In other words, you've shown by dancing, by playfully dancing, that you are not a real man and are not worthy of marriage, let alone marriage with my daughter, instead of competing in sport like a real man, which is how you would get her. Okay, so I'm making this contrast. Dance is like play, dance is different from sport, but in some ways, it is dance and sport that go together and make a contrast with play. Dance and sport take place in definite locations. The Agron in Homer, the Agora in later Greek, the orchestra in the theater, whereas play takes place anywhere. Dance and sport take place on special occasions. Play takes place at any time. Dance and sport often have music to accompany them. This is not so of play. Dance and sport require training and coaching. This is not so of play. In fact, the same trainers are used in dance and sport, according to some writers. Uh, and in terms of gender, dance and sport separate men and women, and play, at least for young people, is not. So where should we place dance in this dichotomy between play and sport? Well, it involves in the, it comes in the middle. Athenians took part in many competitions which involved dance. And so dance is a very important part of festivals. In fact, at the city Dionysia, dance may have been the most important element in the festival, competitive dance, dance in choruses. As many as 1,150 people took part in competitive dancing just at the city Dionysia in Athens alone, and there were many other festivals involving dance. These festivals involved great expense for individuals who sponsored the dances, they involved a great expense for the group 
who were involved in paying for them. Supplies, lots of Canadian money. Peter Wilson has suggested that the competitive course was the team sport of the Greeks. But it does not appear in any of the major competitive festivals which involve athletics and equestrian competition. Many festivals had athletes and horse races and also different forms of what we might call music A. A whole range of singing and playing musical instruments and reciting poetry and painting and competition for heralds, but not dance. You don't find athletic and equestrian competition together with dance competition, except in the Panathenia at Athens, which is the last of the texts which I reproduced for you. A couple of things to point out here. Take a look at the part of the inscription, which is headed Nicateria, which is down at line 83. You have a number of competitions. One of those competitions is Pyrrhic dancing. The Pyrrhic dancing here has some elements in common with the athletic events in this festival and some things in common with the musical events in this festival. Just to mention one, and we can have more in the question period, the Pyrrhic competition is divided into three age groups. The boys, the beardless youths, and the men, which I think you can see there on the inscription. That's the way the athletic events are divided in this festival. But the musical events in this festival just have two divisions, men and boy. So in that way, the Buick dancing is like an athletic event. But if you take a look at who is in charge of these events, something that you can't see, unfortunately, by the inscription, the person in charge of the tug of war, the Uandria, is a gymnasium, is a, an athletic person, but the person in charge of the parrot dancing is a Corey Goss, somebody who's associated with musical events and the theater and so on. So here you can see the parrot dancing is anomalous. It's in the middle. It has elements of both music A and of athletic competition. So here's my second question, question B, which is, why does the Panathenia, alone of major Greek athletic festivals, include competition in dance? And finally, I want to conclude with a quote from Peter Wilson. The chorus occupies a position in a spectrum of collective activity that leads at one extreme to war, passing on its way through more manifestly athletic activities of a kind found in the Olympics such as the racing armor and the javelin throwing of the pentathlon. I think it is important. <laughs> so the question is, you have a range of activities involving physical motion of the body, right from play, right to war. Where do the Greeks make the dividing lines and why? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, and we have as well uh, to uh, take care of the time. The clocks are not the game, but something very difficult. I have many questions about the Homeric part, but I will, I guess you could narrow the question of the answer. So it's not the four, not the competition, but between. Mm -hmm. And uh, what well, is very interesting by the Milky part, that moment of great and flames and gold games. So we could say in French, I think what you have said about music is what we call band camp. So there is two sides and I try to keep. But uh, I need to understand why it's a band camp. But I open the discussion for the one of you, uh, Andrew. So, Mark, thank you so much for this. You said at some point, you know, line, I think I'm very much for everybody, you said that the Greek games are not used. I was trying to think of all the lines where we have the spider, spider in, in different lines. It's always, I think we have a problem, because 
moment where uh, it's not there. Even since it's the day, so to speak, and the university is even if there is a classroom, right? because here we have a lot of students, it's fair, So, um, I want to have a thought plays in your distinction, the kind of negation of illnesses is important. Well, that's a very good question, I suppose. One answer is simply that if something is so strongly identified with innocence, it makes it more effective for the contrast. But there must be more than that. Uh, I wonder sometimes if, and here I saw this open, you know much more about this than I do, if we shouldn't think about the particular way in which the Greek ball was made. Because the Greek ball is, is not uniform, the, the way the balls that many of us know. Um, it, it is made of parts which are stitched together. And uh, at, at the same time as it moves, which of course lends itself to certain images, it, it shows different aspects of itself as it rolls. It's also quite clearly made up of different things. So this may, you know, it, it, it may contribute to its use uh, in images in which contrast and change are implicit. Um, all these things would sound much better in French by so French. Yeah, it would go on exactly with, with this discussion you were having, in a, a, a reciting of the episode of Nausicaa. Is famously a head of this uh, sphera. Marvan Hashem has, has shown how uh, this uses the image of Nausicaa to, to uh, uh, call the, we call the, the hazardousness of uh, the fall of the diamond to the elements. Mm -hmm. So, this, what you were saying that the sphere is not perfect, it means that you cannot control where it's going to rebound. And it's a, it's a clear distinction between a stragaloid. And an imperfect ball and so on, and sports work which you can control, right? The competition, you, you run, you know where you're coming from. Of course, you might throw on something or something, but as if you don't depend on some uh, hazardous uh, rebounds. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting thing. I guess this is a very important point that I love thinking about why does the Homeric heroes doesn't play ball. Um, not at all in the area, and then the only setting up is to show the two examples. But as Amiga uh, says and points that when you have a ball, you have two cables or something like that, uh, chains. The ball and uh, the Woody Allen film shows that very well, you know, match points. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> 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 yeah, this way or this way. Yeah. Now, the problem of QK, this is part of one of the questions we deal with in the last meeting, it's a very interesting question. I think it's impossible in the sport for in the games, and I would say as well, for patrocross, where we have to find the born of patrocross. We need to know which one is the best. And if QK interfere or enter in this, and this moment is the designation of the best, count. Depending of 2K, I would say. It must really be the best to win the challenge for a public class. Well, you know, I don't think I agree with that. Ah, <laughs> that's good. But for Nausicaa, there is also the intervention of Athena. Yes. And this is very important. Really. And the Sino Games, too, there is intervention. And the, the competitions of the Greeks, they always left room for the, the, the initiative of the gods. Isn't that so? That, it's one of the things that you would shrug your shoulders and say, well, I don't know why on this day he was not the best. The gods must have done thus and so. So you could put the part of chains in the field of games. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, know, yes I do. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it depends on what, what we, we, think, we think of it as chance. The Greeks say the gods did this or that. So some of the things, that, in the, if I remember properly, some of the things that the gods and goddesses during the funeral games could be explained by us as saying, oh, that was bad luck. When the younger Ajax falls, 
And, and that is bad luck, even though we know that it isn't because it's terrible and the gods always hate the younger Ajax. In the case of the, um, the whip, which comes out of the hand, it, is, it then is replaced in the hand of the charioteer. Well, this is not to be explained naturalistically. This is the direct intervention of, of the gods, I, I think. Well, I, okay, we can just sit back. Let's uh, yes, yes. 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 Other question? No, I'm, I'm not so sure about this uh, this hazard uh, point because in, I think in all these competitions and in the sportive activities there is uh, an element of, of chance. Or um, chance is not the right uh, expression. Right. Well, this, is the this is the uh, this is the impossibility uh, to um, uh, to really master uh, the movement. You know, it's the same thing when you throw a disc. A discus, discus throwing, javelin throwing, no athlete, even today, is able to do twice the same, exactly the same throw. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a, such a complex movement. The movement mm -hmm. is complex, the instrument is, is complex, so that there's all, this is the competition. You need this dexterity um, to, 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 or to approach the 100%, but you never reach the 100% of mastery. And this is the same thing. I don't see a, a really a big difference uh, between uh, throwing a ball and throwing a distance, uh, for example, uh, um, from this point of view. Mm. Now, dan dance, uh, dance, and dance so also is it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's the, it's the point of the how do you master your body yes. in this movement? You know, you, you, turn, you run around and, and so on and so on. And this is this is a difficult, a difficult thing to master. You better believe it's difficult if you watch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the Greeks, they compete in dance, but they compete in dance in teams, and the teams train and they learn all the movements. They are not. Whereas, for example, in wrestling, we know there are handbooks, there are manuals of training for wrestling. But the problem with wrestling is the other wrestler is doing something too, and he will, he will interfere with your carrying out of the proper maneuver. Whereas if you're dancing in a team, your team is cooperative, so that doesn't happen. You might make a mistake, but nobody is trying to make you make a mistake. So I see a little distinction there. The cooperative nature of the dance, the learning all the moves, is not affected directly by a competitor, though the competitor could do the moves better than you. Thank you so much, Mark. I was just wondering, it's a question of ignorance, whether for the uh, ecstatic uh, Bacchic uh, dances, as we find them with uh, Rudibus and Bacchoi, would they uh, use the same vocabulary? You know, these dances that also be allowed, I, I don't know, it might be interesting to do look at that, or would they consider that from a point of vocabulary as different from the uh, somehow organized competitive dance? Well, here, when it, comes to the, when it comes to the terminology of dance, many people here know more about this than I do, so I would throw it open to our dance experts in the audience. Would it just be the same words? Or is it different? Yeah. No. No. But in the context of a competition in uh, at the, the dramatic festivals in Athens, they operated in the same way. With the Corey Goss and with the competition between the dancers and so on. So they may be doing different dances, I mean one play and another play, but they're all operating under the same competitive envelope. I mean, you can't say that. The, the Bucky dance in any way. The iconography shows very clearly the chaotic and yeah. disorganized nature, right? Mm -hmm. and so then, as a dramatic thing, these terms are, are close to the dance of the with mania, uh, inscription, and so on. That's why I was wondering about the, the exact words, whether when they say dance, they the different words for dance. Anthropologically, it's important to, 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 to 
see the different kind of games. And if I see that with the Nautica example, that I think is a very stimulating one, uh, the question of the goal. Uh, as you say, no goal is better, but the two goals in the creation passages are done by great um, not actors, great artists. Yes, yes, yes. We try to give them as precise as possible. Yes. So, and their creations are also people of very exact yes. people who are over. And they need the natural question of order in certain people to coordinate each movement. Yes. Um, so I guess the goal that anthropologically to say because English is a little bit different from the case. In both I mean for us it could be the same, but for you know, the Hondra test, we want to see to separate them, to forget about maybe then the case can be popular. But trying to to challenge you the description. I had a question about the uh, uh, Apocalypse um, games with the bones, metal games, and it shows that there is a labor there, funeral games of an art for particles. And could you say a little bit more about the link, possibly, if you establish one, let's make sure that you have particles up here, then he has particles to own on him, he remember the metal games uh, problem he had, and then Oculus cancer and organized right. funeral games. Do you establish, do you establish any link with that in the geographic way? To I meant to establish a contrast mm -hmm. between what Patroclus did as a boy and what uh, uh, Yes, and then what Patroclus uh, his friends do. And if, if, I, if we wish to carry it further, immediately after the funeral games, book 24, line 6, we have a reference, a very unusual reference, to Patroclus and his androteta. Which is the, the ancient, the Homeric word for Andrea it means manliness, a very, very unusual word. It is used only in contexts which immediately recall Patronus. So, because it is used right after the funeral games, to my mind, of course, it means, it makes the contrast that I'm making between the boy Patronus and his games and men and their sports strong. Fancy. No, and everybody sees what they want at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you continue to use the word sport for the funeral games. Um, you, you assume that so far because what could be the, the word for sport in, 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 in the ancient time? Um, I guess it was uh, Louis Bobert who showed that Afla was a very important one. And in Afla, he had suffered. Uh, part of suffering or éprouver, in fact. And in French, we have the zépreuve spoken. So the fact that in, in this moment, uh, there was an article, somebody saying that, well, during the funeral games for particles, his people, his princes, his uh, uh, kings, young kings, they needed to have a rest and to change their mind. So they had some sportive activity yes, to, to forget about it. I think it's uh, complicated on the sort of country that the, 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 the funeral games, you say games, but it's not a good word. You should say the funeral after the, the, the competition, the hard competition. Yes, that, that, that is absolutely true. Games is, is a bad translation, it's one of the many crimes of English. Um, it's not really when you say sure or not, for the rate for that dinner. Uh, Paradox to say that. To me, and of course, the Afla is used for the, what we call in English the labors, the Pericles. But the Afla mainly refers to the prize. Pericles yes. does his labor to win a prize. And the prize, whether it's the prize which is imposed on him by Aristus or the prize of immortality which he eventually wins. And in the, fu the funeral compositions of Patroclus, everyone gets a prize. And it, 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 it makes the transition between the, the anger of Achilles and the end of that anger, because at the end, of course, uh, without a competition, he recognizes that um, Agamemnon is the best spear thrower. Mm -hmm. Agamemnon does not have to show his excellence. Achilles says, oh, king, we all know that you are the best. He gives him the prize, and that means that the anger of Achilles is over. 
So in the poem, it does perform, a, I think, an important role. Well, yes, so the role there and the poem. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
voluntary activity. So you have time to work out a lot of friends, eventually, a separate occupation in Pakistan, Italy, carefully isolated from the life for drawing. So from past from the passivity of experience to the activity of play, the opportunity of the students, when you're bruised before and play as an activity, I'm a daily type, which is enjoyed purely for its own sake. Play makes many things. The romantic act, uh, activity of freedom, an opportunity of action, but not an emotion. However, the ancient Greek word for play, well, it would seem to be something much closer to an emotion that its modern European equivalents allow, or so I'll be just this morning. It's not an activity that is engaged in for pleasure, as if by partaking in certain activities called play, for example, all these guys, or some people, a play of my trip or something like that, I want. I mean, it's getting rather a feeling of pleasure that still go for the physical manifestations of that pleasure will be given. Just as an emotion like fear might cause someone to play on their arms drastically and run screaming in a certain direction, I mean, I've thought of someone in a perceived overflow of pleasurable feelings <coughs> to dance, play, and make certain movements just for the pleasure of it. In the case of fear, the physical presentation of that thing is regularly denoted by the term of battle line, one is being routed and so running away. In the case of fear, the physical manifestation is denoted by the surprise, which regularly covers singing, <coughs> and dancing as one of the more typical forms of interest by like rolling dice and ball games and play fighting. But the play out usually not slightly on the division display, children playing with all the toys, as well as play candy games and gambling games, which is not always the case, and the involvement of asymmetry are informative. Take, for example, the climactic passage from the medical treatise on the sacred disease into the end of the fifth century BCE. Here the author is revealing this at the time unusual belief that the brain holds the key not only to the disease of the subject of the treatise, epilepsy, but to a vast array of seemingly soul related phenomena. He writes in Hand Out A. You all have the hand up? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, he writes in Hand Out A. People are to know that pleasures and good moods and laughter and high drag arise from nothing other than the brain. The same goes for pain and sorrow and bad moods and crime. Now, most of these internal states seem to turn up nicely with one another. Pleasures, pain and I, and pain, blue eyes, arise from the brain, from the, the brain to decide whether something is pleasurable or painful, not some other organ or some externalism. And balance of two person mind look like the good way. Although there might be external habits for good moods, like beautiful weather and good luck, such moods can no existence outside of the brain. Laughter, velocity, and crime, and polyphonic, can seem to parallel each other. Both are intimately related to moods and feelings, either as feelings that are inextricable from their external, external manifestations. Or simply the manifestation of the health. However, the opposition, Paiyai, to Mabiya, sorrows, poses the problem. In what sense can games be the opposition to sorrows? Even if the two are not meant to be in parallel, the word Paiyai alone could prove the best of the base. All the other items of the author's list are moods, feelings, and internal states, for example, pleasure, pain, good, and bad, and sorrow. But uh, manifestations of those internal states, for example, lack of crime. They, however, distract the passage away from the group of the social world of dynasty, muscle and football. He can be ignore the plural form, and translate it simply as play. The effect is still incongruous. Play is activity or context for activity, not an internal state or a manifestation of self internal state. I'm still coming through okay? Okay, good. Uh, Translations like Richard Gaines, Jude, John Jett, and Adam Ford, that suggest something like categorical error in them sometimes. But the author really means to introduce the state of linguistic experience, jets, or activities of recreation, games, and sports into the discussion of food and feelings. 
that we can learn by logic, perhaps not by contrast, but not away from the problem. We close to the bar with amusement, with amusement, the word tiny eyes no longer appears to be so anomalous. Uh, like pleasure, pain, good to be bad with laughing and crying, and sorrow of the list of categories feelings and mood. A mood that functions as a suit of love and sorrow, with such pain, pairing, and healing as the office is mentioned. But like pleasure and pain, amusement and sorrow can be understood as feelings created by the brain and the the statement to these authors does seem to be using the word Taiya in a way suggestive of an internal state, something like an emotion or mood. If so, he's not alone. There are a number of instances where play does not seem to be the right translation for Taiya. Consider, for example, the addiction of art as a metropolitan museum. We produce a lot of handoffs, and this is a uh, handoff piece. Seems around this electrical curve of a picture. That is a small jewelry or makeup box. Tiny Ah is found alongside the Ah and Mia, happy them. They felt persuaded by the Tiny Ah's reputation and the Gay Ah's health. Uh, all of the rest was Aphrodite. While at least two of the other abstractions converse with one another, Tiny Ah seems to be in her own world, separated from the rest, entirely focused on balancing a stick on her finger. Her sound is dynamic. Like spread with the weight on the front foot, left arm outstretched to counterbalance the stick, hair is charged with its wings left despite the fact that she's apparently standing still. Happy is not the one who describes her expression. She's not smiling or laughing. Rather, she's focused. Her eyes trained on the distant thing, her eyebrows drawn down, her mouth is closed in a flat line with soft chin to The expression is that some of Concentrated, unaware or uninterested that others might be looking, so biting their nails or holding their tongue between the teeth. We understand the text character and recognize her action immediately. She's like, and biting on me, like. Yet, in this point, we not all interpreters speak the pleasure in this way. For example, for example, translates the inscription by the odd here as a drawing. Such a translation to the passage. We have a different category altogether, whereas joy might be described as an emotion or feeling. Play tends not to be. We might feel uh, joy during play or enjoy play, but it does not make sense to say that play just is joy. Play is an activity, joy is emotion. But what is quick play as a tiny hour? During the period between 425 and 400 BCE, the Shapiro month, Many pictures of Thalia appear on basis basis for more than that of virtual human personification, and some of the other basis on the proper clues. The personified of Thalia is often depicted as a woman holding a necklace of string beads, not only the humble beads, but body and beads. She appears to have a superior rights for the particular features in more expensive places like jewelry. But in what sense is jewelry the placement? We don't need to play with jewelry in the way that children play with sculptures. So the regular occurrence of jewelry in these highly odd depictions comes to something of a surprise. It's interesting.
on their black chairs. These too are not toys, but the lights. The rose sapphos he saw. One of them, the golden necklace strung with amber, in fact, plays a significant role in Emir's story, since this piece of jewelry, which the women handle with their hands and look upon with their eyes, offering a fight, provides the necessary distraction to kidnap the child Emir. Penelope also is described as bestowing delights, again, a formula, on her pet mate servant Alantho. These gifts seem to apply the jewelry, jewelry, <coughs> and baubles, sappho this rather than the more substantial, useful presents. Like the word athurma, the word pygmion often extends beyond the English toy to denote something more like delight. The two terms appear to be interchangeable in East Coast of play the Oroi, and ancient scholars often simply define Athurma with Pygnon, as if they were equivalents. Pygnon, like Athurma, often denotes toy. The infant Dionysus is lured by a toy with bending limbs, that is, a doll, and the Pygnon described in Plato's laws is similar. There, the Athenian provides a number of details about a certain puppet or wind up toy, the word here is found on, that works by means of strings and cords. The cords pull against one another toward opposite actions. Callimachus, in his 12th I Am, describes the seventh day birthday celebration for Hubert's daughter Hebe. The gods bring her various toys, Pythia, some of which are finely carved and more valuable than gold. Later, Utark writes of his daughter with such a gentle spirit that she wanted to share her food not only with the other babies, but with her toys, Pygna, like the dolls. While elsewhere, he mentions children's penchant to cry when one toy, Pygna, is taken away, even if there are many other toys left to play with. But, like a Thurma, Pygna is not constricted to the English toy, not least because the Greek verb itself, Pyzo, covers territories of delight and pleasure beyond the English verb play. The comic poet Ephippus calls certain dinner table delicacies Pyglia, though the guests were not technically playing with these ordos in the English sense of the word. Similarly, Columbus describes a nautilus shell as a delight or trinket, Pygmion, for the late Queen Arsinoe, an object of natural splendor, not unlike the Narcissus flower, which delighted Persephone, as mentioned above. That these particular delights are immediate, and thus generally associated with children and women, can be seen in Pluto, who describes a man wearing a certain golden ball of Pygmion among his dazzling dress. The context here is essential. Plutarch is trying to depict the man as a feminine, and the very fascination with such baubles as frivolous and belonging to the feminine sphere. Thus, it would appear that the Greek words that usually cover the English toy, athurma, hypnon, also regularly denote objects like jewelry, necklaces, and other such delights, as if such objects were understood to be in the same class as toys. To return to the clauses depicting Pythia, personified with, as Shapiro writes, a particular interest in more expensive places like jewelry. It is not that the adult female Pythia is playing with such objects, at least not in the way that the child Pythia plays with the balance of the stick. It is rather that she delights in such objects, and this delight is what is shared with the child Pythia who delights in her toy. Like the passage from the sacred disease, play here does not seem fully to cover the range of this year, even if the metropolitan depiction appears unmistakably familiar. Ferrari's translation of joy for the abstraction instead points to another dimension of ideology, one which denotes not the activity but the internal state out of which such activities arise. 
Although translated, often show awareness of this aspect of the word. Your interest, I think, lies not in finding some suitable translation from the Greek idea that can cover delight, enjoyment, play, amusement, and others simultaneously. It rather lies in grasping the conceptual challenge that ancient Greek idea offers us. How can this emotive aspect of joy or delight be understood as continuous with that other aspect, namely that activity we think of as play? For us, the natural relationship between the two insists on a separation. The play activity, the dice, and patch, gives rise to joy and delight. But the Greek offers a reversal and so a promise of continuity. Joy and delight cause people to dance, the word is kaizo, to, uh, to sing, also kaizo, and engage in other forms of play, like balancing a stick, throwing a ball, and rolling the dice. The continuity suggested by this is not that singing, dancing, and playing are results of joy or delight, but rather that they just are forms what are forms of joy and joy. So how exactly does this work? Understanding this continuum is the real challenge, I think. What emerges is a concept of play markedly different from the one that we have inherited from modernity. A concept of play is not a certain set of activities that unleashes a certain feeling of pleasure, but rather play is a certain feeling of pleasure that unleashes the activities we think of as that is we all. Okay, then, so we went with uh, Stephen, but that would be the question. Yeah, maybe I can ask you if I can be the messenger of your questions. Uh, I will try. So, yeah. Plus, someone uh, has uh, a point to be underlined or something you would say. Or you will, you will make me a messager silencieux. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good, good. So we, go, we stop the camera in case it helps. And David will ask you a question. Yes. Yeah, I don't see you anymore, but maybe you listen my voice and I am the messenger of, uh, <laughs> of our room. Um, I know that there are many specialists of toys and Barry is working with the Musée du Jouet. Uh, by the way, it is Mark Golden who uh, very, uh, who performed your text and he did it very well. So uh, it was a uh, pleasure for us to listen to your uh, thinking through the voice of uh, Mark. Um, I, I remember you recently did to know Do you hear me? Hello. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we will have a short. So one of the many questions we wanted to ask you, uh, you very well showed the importance to, uh, to read the Greek words. And uh, the way you show the link between the toy and jewelry is very, very interesting. Uh, also the story of Pluta is the little girl giving food to her babe uh, uh, so that is very interesting. And since we worked be before in the last um, uh, expose by Mark, we were speaking about the ball, not only as a toy, but also as a possible arm. And I was interested that if we say that jewelry is for women, what arms are for men. You remember when Achilles uh, is, uh, 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 has a woman uh, appearance in order to, uh, to, to uh, show he's not a woman, 
goodies, all these are really offered uh, jewelry and among the jewelry there is a knife and after the similar with the knife. Where in your um, category would you, you put, uh, put the arms? Is it possible to say that arms are for men, what jewelry are for women and toys for uh, children? Which is a little funny question we wanted to ask you. Again, well, this is this is amazing. I wish I heard this talk because I, I'm not I'm not sure that I've come across uh, artwork or art on uh, referring to um, weapons or arms. I, I, I know that sometimes um, uh, I, can, I can think of two times where it's used uh, metaphorically, but um, you know, I think about it and it's like war is sort of
They were out of that house in the hotel. That was only too late because they were out of the Thank <laughs> you. 